right, that's better. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Viktor Smokarovs. I'm the special envoy on uh, digital affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Latvia, and uh, uh, welcome to uh, this discussion on combating disinformation without resorting to online censorship. And I'll start by saying that if you look at the picture uh, behind my back, it says censor. It said censor, but of course what we wanted to say, censorship. So combating disinformation without resorting to online censorship. Uh, online disinformation has uh, entered uh, the global agenda as a major threat to public safety. And those of us who have followed the discussion here at the IGF, I think will recognize that this has been uh, one of the prominent topics. And indeed, uh, Disinformation threatens public safety, security, and democratic stability of nations. And this issue has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but there is also a recognition of uh, the need to address this issue uh, while upholding human rights, especially freedom of expression. There is a tendency uh, for implicit or even explicit online censorship to be used as a way, at least seemingly, to address real or presumed threats posed by disinformation. And a particular challenge here is that uh, technology companies have failed to build in sufficient free speech safeguards into their policies and procedures to combat falsehoods on their platforms. The Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Right to Freedom of Opinion and Expression, Irene Khan, who again has participated uh, in the IGF uh, remotely uh, this time, uh, said that the responses by states and companies to disinformation, quote, have been problematic, inadequate, and detrimental to human rights, unquote. So the idea at the core of this uh, session is simple. Disinformation can and should be addressed without resorting to censorship bans or internet shutdowns. The real question is how do we uh, do it? Uh, to discuss this issue today, we have uh, an excellent panel that is partially present here and partially online with us uh, at uh, this table with us. Uh, I'll quickly present the speakers uh, before I introduce the question. Uh, uh, next to me uh, uh, is Mr. Alan Cheboy, who is Senior Investigative Manager at uh, the uh, NGO Code for Africa. Uh, next to him is uh, uh, Mr. Richard Bombos, who heads the Strategic Communications Coordination Department at the State Chancery of Latvia, so he's part of the Latvian government. Now, we have two speakers uh, joining us online, and I trust they already are uh, ready. Uh, Mr. Lutz Gunnar, who is Head of Strategic Communications, uh, Task Forces and Information Analysis Division at the European External Action Service. He will be joining us from Brussels. And uh, Ms. Anna Osterlink, who had uh, one of the uh, research arms of uh, the international non-governmental organization, Article 19. Now, uh, we also have uh, a pre-recorded message from the Under Secretary General of the United Nations for Global Communication, uh, Ms. Melissa Fleming. She was not able to attend in person, but was kind enough to uh, record a message for us. Now, the way we uh, want to do it is uh, like this. Uh, uh, we take uh, the first, I would say, main question, and I would ask each uh, participant to uh, give their views on the issue uh, within the time frame of about five, uh, max six minutes. Then uh, we have the next speaker, and then uh, we uh, take the next question. We will always start with the speakers who are uh, present in the room, and then go over online uh, and after at the end of the first round uh, we will hear the message from 
uh, Melissa Fleming. Uh, so the first question we asked uh, our uh, participants to address is this. What is uh, the state of arts uh, the most uh, relevant at the moment? Uh, a uh, way to conceptualize this information. How do we understand it uh, in a way that is uh, relevant for, practice, uh, for practical policy making, for actually addressing uh, this issue uh, uh, in real life? For example, what are the implications of distinguishing between misinformation, disinformation, and information uh, manipulation. So this is a theoretical question, but still has some very real implications when we uh, uh, have to think of the way to address uh, the challenge uh, uh, so that we also preserve and safeguard uh, freedom of expression uh, online. So how do we do it? How do we conceptualize disinformation uh, so that freedom of expression doesn't suffer. Uh, Alan Cheboy, you are the first to speak. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so just to do a quick introduction, as uh, it was mentioned, my name is Alan Cheboy. I represent a civic tech organization called Code for Africa. Uh, Code for Africa is a pan-African organization currently operating in about 23 African countries. And the primary goal for Code for Africa is actually to provide uh, factual and actionable information for citizens to make their own decisions. And it is for that context that we've been primarily involved in researching disinformation uh, in itself and misinformation on the continent for the last about three to four years. And I think for these specific questions, I like to illustrate it using uh, an example that I'm just going to showcase on the screen. Uh, it's good to just walk back and for any layman in the room to actually understand that disinformation is actually part of a larger ecosystem of terms that is under the umbrella called information disorder. And this basically shows that uh, misinformation in itself can be, as you can see, there is a red uh, a circle and a, and a gray circle. So if you want to contextualize it, is misinformation is false information that you see on digital platforms, but uh, the person who's sharing that information has no ill intention to harm the recipient of that specific information. However, this information, which is in, in the intersection between you know, the gray and the red bar on the, on the screen, is now information that is false in the first place. But the person sharing that information has an ill intention to actually deceive or to influence the decisions of the recipient of that information. So it's clear to have that in mind because how you approach actually researching and countering these two elements is very, very different. Malinformation, on the other hand, can be true information. It doesn't have to be false, but the information is shared so that the person who that information is about is actually going to be harmed. So this could, when you're talking about leaks, when you're talking about uh, someone being harassed, uh, hate speech. So all that is categorized as malinformation. But I think there is one thing that people uh, forget when we talk about disinformation, and this is what we refer to as information manipulation, or in other terms, some, some people refer to it as influence operations. And it's a really huge component of it because this primarily falls under the disinformation umbrella. And it's on a larger global scale because uh, I can explain a little bit. Historically, information manipulation was actually used by military organizations and governments to actually influence the decisions in a specific jurisdiction, say a country uh, or a nation or even you know, an, a continent, for example. And it is important to actually highlight that recently because of the social media, you know, uh, adoption of social media, technological advancement, digital media, even the normal citizen, someone seated in their own home, can actually influence the decisions of millions of people in another, in another jurisdiction or in another country. So, and they can actually use false information to do that, right? And I'll give a quick, quick example of how that specifically happens. And I'll use examples from the African continent. As I mentioned, we've been looking at uh, uh, disinformation on the African continent for a number of years. And we, sta we started picking up actually 
targeted information operations originating from you know uh, different jurisdictions different uh, other continents trying to influence decisions in different african countries and these are usually very high budget uh, operations they are not when you when you talk about a local disinformation uh, or influence operation or a, or a domestic influence operations these are the ones that you consider to be things such as you know targeting at elections or a political candidate uh, using disinformation against an opponent to actually win the election uh, or to influence the decisions of a particular uh, you know members of community so it is important to know that that domestic one there is a lot of investment that is uh, is actually uh, 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 there is a lot of it, investment in that but there is also global political situations where different countries actually try to influence decisions in, in, in different other countries. And also the investment there and the budgets that are, that are used in this are really, really massive. So we need to also be curious on what happens. And I'll use this specific uh, example that we see recently. This is in the DRC, uh, in the DRC just recently, where we started seeing a lot of uh, coordinated campaigns, disinformation campaigns targeting MONUSCO, which is the peacekeeping arm of the United Nations in DRC and they were really tailored to influence the decisions of these individuals to actually act against the, 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 the MONUSCO uh, uh, organ I mean the MONUSCO intervention peacekeeping operation and it led to the deaths of so many people right because uh, this is just basically people seeing things online for a very long time that they end up believing it and when that happens at the end of the day they are influenced to take action in a particular way so it is really really important and I'll also just show one more thing. Uh, so the one more thing I want to show is a, a quick video that we identified on the internet and the reason I'm showing this video is because uh, this is kind of from a global political situation where we saw a video started which has which started trending in the west africa side of, uh, of uh, the western africa side allegedly it is as you can see it's very high budget it's actually a comic that had been produced showing as you can see zombies eating normal individuals in uh, in in the in the central africa republic but it was kind of a perception that you know this is what is happening in the Central African Republic. The president calling some people from foreign governments to actually intervene, uh, and as you can see on this video, these foreign people come in with jets and they kill all these zombies. The president thanks them for for the intervention, and the citizens are very happy. But at the end of the day, what is presented is that you know this day we have these angelic saviors who can come and help you in your own country. So this is high budget production and it's an influence operation uh, type of campaign that we need to also be contextualizing. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I think it's a very interesting illustration. Uh, but uh, very quickly, a follow-up question to this. So uh, there are different uh, types you operate with, uh, misinformation, disinformation, and more information. Will you choose the methods to, ad methods to address these that will be different, or is it the same? A very quick answer, please. Very different, because misinformation is dealt with using fact-checking, because it's content-based. You're looking at the content that is being shared online. Is it false? Is it true, right? That's why you're, you're looking at it. But disinformation, the approach that we use even at Code for Africa is we have a network of like data analysts and data scientists who actually audit social media platforms and the content on these platforms to identify content that we believe to be concerning or being shared in a coordinated way. Because as I, as I mentioned, disinformation has an intention behind it. So there is a massive investment behind it. And for you to identify it, you actually need to go a little bit in depth, look at the drivers of that disinformation content. What are the narratives? What are the tactics being used by these disinformation operatives? Uh, thank you. So we are at least uh, looking at uh, uh, identifying and analyzing as the first step to any practical solution. But perhaps we uh, can look at the other steps. So we go from the civil society perspective, we can now go over to the perspective of a, of a national government that will probably deal with all the types of uh, phenomena that were just mentioned here. So, Richard, what's your conceptual framework? And also, again, based on that conceptual framework, what are your tools as the governmental team, so to say, to address this? Uh, thank you, Victor. Uh, um, 
Well, uh, I, I will give you both a short answer and a bit, uh, bit more uh, elaborated answer as well. So the short answer is we have taken this information definition from, from the European Union, uh, especially from the European Democracy Action Plan adopted uh, exactly two years ago. Uh, and according to the plan, uh, disinformation is a false or misleading content uh, disseminated with a purpose to mislead or to gain political or economic benefit or to harm the state or societal security. That's in a nutshell. So the emphasis, as you can see, and as also explained by the, by the previous speaker, is on the motivation, on the motivation and the intention to do harm and to do it on purpose, to do it intentionally. So the longer answer, however, is I also want to approach this question more broadly uh, and, and, and give answer on the meaning of the disinformation uh, from uh, one side and also why Latvia knows a thing or two about the disinformation and, and this phenomenon. So yesterday at the opening of IGF, um, the UN Security uh, uh, Secretary General in his address outlined two key challenges uh, we all have to tackle in the 21st of centuries, namely climate change and uh, digital transformation. I couldn't agree more with uh, Mr. Guterres. However, I would argue that we are also facing a global man-made disinformation disaster. Yes, you heard it right. Uh, disinformation, uh, in our opinion, is a man-made uh, disaster uh, on a global scale. Uh, essentially, every disaster uh, needs two elements to qualify such event, uh, namely uh, to be called a disaster. First, uh, it needs a hazardous event or a pressure. And second, it needs uh, a vulnerable people or society is affected by that event or pressure. Uh, and this information fills both of these criteria. Uh, WHO uh, two years ago called this phenomenon infodemia, uh, when in context of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, authoritarian regimes, including Russia and China, uh, spread lies, for example, to stop people from uh, believing in a pandemic and the seriousness of the pandemic or afterwards in, in vaccination. When, when the vaccines were available. Similarly, since Russia's full-scale war on Ukraine, uh, this information has been used as, as a weapon of war uh, in, 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 in many different ways. Uh, this, uh, the Kremlin back channels serve as weapons of mass destruction in, in the hands of Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. and, and from that aside, we also see the societies uh, that are vulnerable and not armed enough to protect ourselves to counter these disruptive behaviors and pressures uh, due to lack of safeguards, mainly not introduced fast enough, responsibly enough uh, from social media platform side. Uh, our emotions uh, serve as catalysts uh, and they work against us and they serve as catalysts to deepen the wounds of disinformation. So we are in this event where we have pressure points from one side and vulnerable societies to the other, and we are facing a global uh, man-made uh, disaster called disinformation. So now a bit more elaborate uh, answer on why should one listen or learn to La from Latvia. So first and foremost, I think because we are an honest small country from the north of uh, Europe, and uh, we don't have any hidden agenda. We have come here to just share our knowledge accumulated over, over, over years uh, to this end. And we are a nation that not only adheres to the principles of the UN Charter, but we actually have chosen to champion a few of them, especially when it comes to the media freedoms and when it comes to the security of information space. And because we have also lived next to Russia for, uh, for centuries, <laughs> and especially since you, uh, since restoration of our independence since the 90s, uh, last century, uh, we have seen the full spectrum of disinformation uh, being uh, and being targeted uh, by that uh, in, in different by different manipulation methods. Uh, we know how to recognize them, and more importantly, we know how to counter them. Uh, also, because we want to share this know-how with other countries that are ready to listen and learn to how to protect ourselves uh, against disinformation disaster. And we have used every multilateral fora so far uh, to do this, to champion this and share our knowledge, including at the United Nations. And here uh, I would like to uh, say that it should come up, uh, as no surprise that uh, last year in 2021, Latvia together with Australia and Jamaica were the uh, countries uh, championing and spearheading a UN uh, General Assembly resolution on media and information uh, literacy week. Similarly, we have other, uh, used other formats and, and we have uh, built uh, centers of excellence on strategic communications in Riga, in our capital, centers on excellence on uh, protecting and, and uh, media freedoms. 
and, and, and supporting media throughout the region and other. Uh, nationally, we have chosen a holistic uh, approach based on the whole of government and whole of society uh, strategy. And we have, of course, my team doing the job at the center of government, at the government office, and what kind of functions do we have? We have several. So we, we, pr we provide a centralized uh, information space monitoring capacity, both traditional and social media for the government decision makers, just to see the full spectrum of information space, including uh, potentially uh, malicious behavior. Uh, we also coordinate uh, government comms. Uh, we do a lot of capacity building. Uh, we, of course, do crisis communication, strategic advice during a crisis, and, of course, a lot of, a lot of international co uh, collaboration and cooperation, including with the tech, tech platforms. However, we understood quite early on that a single unit, a single team, will not be able to stop uh, all the billions of dollars being spent every year by the Kremlin and even more by China on, on, on spreading disinformation. Uh, and we will never be able to compete in the human power being uh, come from, the, uh, come from the other side. Uh, therefore, we need to uh, choose a different strategy, not just to react uh, and debunk everything uh, being thrown at us, but we have to be proactive. And we have to build our strategy on empowerment and on, on, on an open and giving agency, giving agency to other government institutions, to municipalities, but also to the society at large. So our national strategy and approach to the inf information space security is built on three pillars. And e all three pillars are equally important and the whole system is only as strong as the weakest link. So effective government communications is one, pillar, second pillar is quality independent journalism and media, and the third pillar is the societal level, which in my opinion is the most important one. Uh, so we are bu building a lot of capacities, we are investing in media and information literacy, and uh, we have a lot of know-how on how to do it. I will stop here, but I'm uh, also uh, willing to share uh, how we have applied this framework uh, to the uh, to the, this year, for example, in the context of Russia's war in Ukraine since 24th of February. Thank you. Well, thank you, Richard. I think uh, it was a little bit over the a lot of time, but I think we got part of the answer to the second question that is that logically follows. Okay, how do you do it? So we can come back to that. Uh, so a whole uh, arsenal of different tools at the disposal of governments. Uh, from Alan, we heard uh, monitor and analyze, fact check. That's uh, I understand is your contribution uh, as the civil society. So we haven't, any of us yet, used the censorship tool, which is great. Now, uh, we can now go to our online speakers, and I would, I'd like to go to Lutz Gunnar, first of all, because uh, the EU uh, indeed has recognized that disinformation is a, a great challenge. Uh, it has been developing tool. there are tools that are plans and documents that Rick has already mentioned, but at the same time, the EU has always been very clear that addressing disinformation must be uh, done uh, within the uh, framework of, uh, of human rights and fundamental rights, including freedom of expression. So, Lutz, what's your framework that you work with every day, and how do you uh, use it in this uh, uh, rights-compliant manner. Maybe you can tell us what uh, your limits are, things that you do not do as the EU uh, because it has to be part of this rights-compliant uh, uh, framework. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, and very nice uh, to speak to you. And sorry that I cannot be there in person. Um, but I think the key question that we need to answer is exactly the one that Alan put on the table. What exactly is the problem? Because what is happening very often is that we design kind of responses to a problem before we have actually uh, precisely said what is the problem in there. And if you allow me, I would love to share uh, just one slide with you. If you see this, um, I think you... Can you see it? It's a slide. Let me do this here, which 
voila, which uh, shows you basically five things that we need to keep in mind when we speak about disinformation. And as Alan already said beforehand, there are so many different forms of malinformation, misinformation, etc. Um, the key thing is really what what is it that we want to stop? Do we want to stop information pollution in general? I think this would be a very dangerous path because uh, information pollution exists everywhere. Um, and it's nothing that we can solve with any regulatory or government uh, or governmental kind of approaches. So first, distinguish uh, the different elements from each other. And I would follow to a large degree exactly um, the dichotomy, or sorry, the, the categorization of Allen, um, misinformation being unintentional and therefore a different challenge. Disinformation already a very, very clear intention behind, but I would also like to highlight that disinformation in that sense can be very much focused on economic gains, for example, is not only a political uh, enterprise always. But we have a third category, and that might be very, very important for us to keep in mind when we speak here about internet governance, if we speak about United Nations actions, etc., that also state actors um, are very active in that field. State actors using this tool, using these instruments uh, for their own strategic aims, uh, for their activities. And important in this is that what they are doing or what we are seeing every day is that it's not necessarily the classic perception of having a constructed and false uh, content, but that, uh, as you see here on the slides, um, we basically need to look at five different uh, components. The first one is it needs to be harmful, otherwise we shouldn't care. If there's non-harmful uh, um, content, uh, it would not be a big problem. Then our next challenge is that it is not illegal double negation. So we don't have clear laws and we should not have clear laws uh, for the reason that we're discussing here. Then for me, the key is it, there needs to be an element of manipulation in there. Manipulation, I will come back to that at three levels. Um, then exactly what Alan said, the intentional element uh, needs to be there. And last but not least, also uh, the element of coordination, because if it's just a single uh, event, a single um, moment that this is happening, uh, then it wouldn't be a problem. So my um, proposal also for our discussion is let's really distinguish these different things because the policy flowing from that will uh, need to react to that. Our approach has been to focus on uh, what we call the ABC model. So not only to focus on the content. Why? Because very often the content uh, has been taken um, out of, let's say, um, out of, uh, or uh, the content in itself, sorry, is not necessarily false, is not even verifiably uh, false, you know? So a lot of the disinformation and information manipulation that is being used is actually operating with true facts, if you want, but the contextualization, the presentation, uh, the way this is presented is, uh, is um, the, the disinformation activity, the information manipulation activity. So that is very important that we don't only focus on the content, but on the B uh, of the ABC, and that is the behavior, behavior of actors, how it is produced. What techniques are they using? How are they disseminating? What manipulative tactics are they using? Because that allows us to move actually away from this focus on content and put it in two baskets, true and false, black and white, good and bad, um, which is a dangerous path in particular because it leads towards uh, censorship uh, tendencies. So ABC model, uh, A, I should have also mentioned, you need to understand, of course, the actor also behind his or her intentions in this. Um, otherwise, you cannot complete the picture. And let me close by saying um, manipulation cannot only happen at the level of of content, as I said, um, but also the manipulation of, for example, identities. We often don't 
take this enough into account that false accounts, inauthentic net uh, networks, etc., is as important as falsified content, because sometimes these techniques try to amplify uh, specific narratives, try to focus on existing, uh, let's say, debates also that exist already in a in a society, and just by amplifying, they reach their strategic aims. So this. Um, uh, this manipulation of identities is important and the manipulation of, of reach is important. We have tried to put all this together, focus on this behavior, and have developed a four kind of area approach that I'm happy to come back in the next question to. But for me, it's very important, again, to underline not to play the, let's say, the, the role of the, of the police, you know, that can give an indication what can be said and what cannot be said, what is good and what is bad, but to identify these practices or what we call the TTPs, the techniques, tactics and procedures that are being used um, to, to manipulate. And that will enable us also to move away from this tendency sometimes uh, that some members, even in the United Nations systems, have taken to enact uh, so-called fake news laws or disinformation laws uh, that focus on content, that uh, pre-describe what is good and what is bad, what can be said and what cannot be said, which uh, we believe is actually very often used more as an excuse, as a pretext for censorship. The approach that I just laid out uh, would allow us to do this in an objective manner. It would allow to tackle a lot of the problems in there. And uh, in the next round of questions, I'll show you how we do this in uh, di with different tools. Thank you very much, Lutz. Uh, we will come back to the tools again in the uh, uh, next uh, question, but I must uh, warn that the next round is going to be very quick, so uh, we are running short of time. Uh, but uh, we now go over to Anna Oslink to uh, address the same question, the conceptual thinking behind disinformation and how do you also conceptualize responses that are based on uh, respect for freedom of expression and of course it's obvious that for an organization called article 19 this must be a topic that uh, you have an opinion on so anna please the floor is yours and please uh, keep it to five minutes thank you thank you so much the pleasure of going last i have to stick to the time thank you very much uh, thank you for the floor and thank you to latvia for organizing this session um so my name is anna Oslink, and i speak on behalf of Article 19, which is indeed an international human rights organization promoting freedom of expression and related rights. And we have been working a lot on the right to freedom of expression information vis-a-vis -vis disinformation, and in particular during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to try to answer the question in, in five quick points um, and then leave a little bit for the second round. Um, so, as, as we all know, disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, they're not new. Although, as an organization, we fully recognize that recently the issue has emerged into an increasingly digital society and has triggered heated debates over politics, journalism, social media, and the exercise of the right to freedom of expression and information. And there's obviously no denying that various forms of disinformation are available abundantly especially on social media and can cause some significant harm, clearly evidenced during the COVID-19 pandemic with wild claims about alleged remedies and conspiracy theories over its origin, many other things. But the first point I would like to make is that the scale of the problem is of course, not only digital technologies. This information must be seen in a wider context including one, reduced pluralism and reduced diversity of information that we can access online, two, the challenges connected to the digital transformation of the media, and three, the underlying social causes, including economic and social inequalities, leading to mistrust and polarization. And all these factors combined ultimately create an environment where disinformation can flourish. Now, the second point I'd like to make is that Although we know that these different concepts are being used, disinformation, misinformation, et cetera, et cetera, 
we do like to remind everyone, as, as I'm sure we're all aware, that there is no agreed definition in international regional human rights law. And that's obviously where we would start as an organization called Article 19, is what is an international law? So there is no agreed definition. The third point I'd like to make is that although we have seen calls to address this information intensifying in recent months and years, and particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, we do we would like to point out that the issue has already been addressed to some extent in different legal fields fields think for example to laws on defamation for example so restrictions on false statement of facts that cause substantial harm to a person's reputation or laws on election fraud or laws on misleading advertising or sales of certain products and and so forth as just to name a few examples so there is already some protection out there in terms of the harmful effects of disinformation. The fourth point I would like to make that then if states do feel they need to make restrictions on freedom of expression is to remind them of course of Article 19 um, and the way how to do this. And obviously we know there's a three part test in Article 19 of the ICCPR in terms of how to restrict freedom of expression. And unfortunately, in, in what we have found is that restrictive legislation on disinformation typically fail this three-part test of Article 19 of the ICCPR, meaning they do not meet the principles of legality, legitimacy, proportionality, and necessity. We're very concerned about attempts to enact a legal duty of truth, and we don't agree with using the concept of disinformation or related concepts in legislation. And in the interest of time, I would just want to highlight one of the three principles and how our concerns play out. So as we all know, no universally agreed definition. So consider then the principle of legality, which means restrictions on free speech must be formulated with sufficient precision in order to foresee the consequences of your actions. However, given disinformation is a very complex problem, we believe that any attempts to define disinformation or capture all its complexities in one catch-all definition will be inherently broad and vague. And then I can talk more about the other principles, but I just wanted to focus on one. So we don't, as an organization, don't advocate to restrict disinformation through specific legislation or to do it in isolation. So my fifth point is what do we do recommend is holistic positive measures. And I can talk about this more in the next question, but just to say that Special Rapporteur Irene Khan summed up very well our primary position on disinformation. And I quote, the right to freedom of opinion and expression is not part of the problem. It is the objective and the means for combating disinformation, end quote. And so that would be our answer to the problem is uh, a range of positive holistic measures by a range of actors. But I can come back to that in the next question. I thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, there will be an next round uh, where we will ask the speakers to very quickly give these uh, uh, name, name the tools that uh, you believe have to be used. But before we go to the second round, uh, we have a message uh, uh, recorded by uh, uh, Miss Melissa Fleming for us to share about uh, with us uh, how the United Nations uh, tackle the issue of disinformation, what the most important development of processes are, and what examples of cooperation within the United Nations uh, framework uh, uh, on addressing disinformation uh, we should look at. So we can now go over to uh, the uh, message from Melissa Fleming. Could you please play the video in the back? Here at the United Nations, we have been monitoring for years how, how lies are poisoning our societies and also how mis- and disinformation spread online and are causing real harm to our world. We certainly saw it at the height of COVID-19 uh, when the pandemic hit, all kinds of conspiracy theories emerged, placing public health and in grave and imminent danger. 
And we also saw claims that the pandemic was a hoax, claims that it planned to trigger the rise of a new world order, claims about miracle fake cures or that vaccines are a plot, plot to depopulate the planet. And we're also seeing this in relation to the climate emergency, where vested interests are they say financing the deliberate um, or actually vested interests are financing the deliberate undermining of science, doing it to delay climate action and preparedness. Um, these actors are using tactics that range from direct climate change denial, but also to so-called woke watching, uh, woke washing, namely the framing of climate action as being corrupt or elitist in order to spread doomism or fatalism. We are also seeing the harmful effects of online disinformation in many conflict situations around the world. Back in 2018, the UN found that disinformation and hate speech spread online played a significant role in stoking horrific atrocities against the Rohingya population in Myanmar. They poured oil on the fire of old divisions and pushed ordinary citizens to commit unspeakable acts. And similar stories have emerged in many other conflict settings. For example, recently in Ethiopia, there were Facebook posts that spread hate and incited attacks, killings, and displacement. In Iraq, militant groups are spreading sectarian hate on Telegram, on Facebook, and YouTube. And of course, these patterns are playing out in Ukraine very dramatically, where information is also being used as a weapon of war. And meanwhile, in Ukraine's neighboring countries, we are seeing um, the spreading of lies about refugees, uh, making the most vulnerable once again to suffer. So analyzing these phenomena, we realized that in less than two decades since the birth of today's tech giants, their design flaws are clearly turbocharging real harm inflicted to our world. Social media platforms are hardwired to drive engagement, but this engagement puts profit above civility. They amplify provocative material over facts and they can generate outrage and division and downplay informed and nuanced debate, informed and nuanced debate that we need so desperately for our world. Of course, platforms are also crucial tools for those working to make the world a better place. For example, in autocratic states, they allow people to seek out banned news. In war zones, they allow uprooted people to keep in touch and also movements have been born on social media that have improved human rights. This is why in several countries, digital platforms are pressed by the authorities to take steps undermining free speech, either by taking down entirely legitimate content or by using upload filters. The UN has urged the platforms to respond to such demands by standing up to the rights to privacy and free expression and by reporting on pressures that infringe those rights with full transparency and speed. The Secretary General himself has underlined that a human-centered digital space begins with the protection of free speech, freedom of expression, and the right to online autonomy and privacy. But free speech is not a free pass, he also noted. In the era of mis- and disinformation, free speech is about much more than freedom to say whatever you want online. Free speech isn't about being unorthodox for the thrill of it. Freedom of expression stops at hatred that incites discrimination, hostility, or violence. Platforms must face the fact that they are constantly being abused by bad actors and live up to their responsibility to protect human rights and save lives. For this reason, at the United Nations, we are constantly engaging with the platforms and advocating that they do their human rights due diligence, but also review their business models against 
the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. We want platforms to offer a robust framework to reduce the speed of harmful falsehoods and establish mechanisms to remedy them. Especially in conflict situations, platforms need human moderators reviewing content in real time, moderators fluent in local languages, but also attuned to the local and regional contexts. Moreover, we want to see platforms move decisively against those profiting from hateful content through policies that limit the monetization of harm. I want to also say that my social media team works day in and day out to distill trustworthy UN information into accessible posts for our millions of followers, which we share through the social media platforms. Uh, an example of this effort is an initiative called Verified that we launched together with the Social Impact Agency Purpose in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this was to get accurate, life-saving information out to communities and around the world and compete in those very same spaces where disinformation actors were having such an influence on people's decisions. We're also working to strengthen the capacity of social me media users to identify on their own and avoid the lies by promoting media and information literacy and by creating our own teaching tools. So among others, my team has launched two free online digital literacy courses on mis and disinformation in collaboration with WikiHow in multiple languages that are being taken by students of uh, disinformation all over the world and hopefully uh, improving their ability to spot mis and disinformation and not become part of the spreading problem. Last but not least, we are advocating to states as well to promote various measures to encourage the free flow of information, to enhance media diversity, and to support independent public interest media as a means of countering disinformation. Oh, a very clear In and I would say strong message from uh, Melissa Fleming speaking on behalf of the United Nations uh, and she also mentioned I think some things that the UN uh, does uh, to uh, address the issue. Now the second round is where we uh, want to hear from our speakers what the most important instruments are and uh, I think uh, also we can attach the third question to this one what, in your opinion, uh, could be done to help other countries mobilize uh, the knowledge and resor resources that are needed to address this uh, issue effectively? So, what do you do uh, in your domestic area, so to say, and what do you think can be done to uh, cooperate better on uh, the topic of disinformation? We go in the same order and start, uh, start starting with you, Alan, please. And please, very concisely. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, I just want to, to actually uh, insist on what Anna said, which is, I think, one very important thing when it comes to the research that we do. Someone mentioned that they want to know like the tools we use, how we do it. Uh, we do use social media monitoring and digital media monitoring tools, but at the end of the day, that is just a means to an end, to give you access to the information that is available on the platforms. So it doesn't necessarily mean that tells you this is disinformation, this is misinformation. So I think one clear strategy that everyone needs to, to know is that uh, the tools are just a means to an end. You need to actually have human uh, intervention in any type of analysis so that we don't end up crossing over to you know censoring any specific individual. And I want to insist on one specific thing is that it doesn't mean, as, uh, as we've just had, it doesn't mean that we need to give a free pass to every other person who shares this information and, and hate online. One thing is clear is that we do have malign actors who have their own intentions. And wha we need, what we need to be doing is that we need to be safeguarding these specific uh, spaces that we are we are having the, the the conversations like social media and through the media because this is where our young children this is where our youth get their own information there's an interesting research that I got just recently uh, saying that 40% of 
young people, Gen Z, uh, they refer to as Gen Z, actually go to TikTok for first-hand information. Traditionally, that was Google. Yeah, everyone wanted to go to Google. So we need to be thinking about that. And just one final thing that I wanted to insist on is, we, I don't think we need to, as Anna said, we, we should not be regulating disinformation itself. We need to be regulating the, because disinformation actually thrives when rights are being abused, right? Uh, we need to be looking at regulatory fr frameworks that actually address uh, things that are going against the rights of individuals in different countries, right? So we need to be customizing these uh, legal frameworks. We need to be customizing the laws to actually include this information, uh, uh, you know, monitoring as an element, but not monitoring this information itself because people have other intentions around it. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And over to you, Richard. So, the most important tools, very quickly. Uh, very shortly, I think I out outlined the tools that we have at our dis uh, disposal already in my previous intervention. So, all three pillars very important for those of you who, who probably came in uh, uh, late. So, we, uh, we have uh, this approach based on a whole of government, whole of society approach. So, every government, ministry, and institution has to get involved, and every member of the society has to have a minimum level of awareness and, uh, of dis on disinformation, on uh, manipulation techniques, uh, how to recognize how to counter them, how to report to the social media platforms themselves uh, abusive content, how to report to the state police and other services. This, Yes, uh, the main strategy behind this is to limit the space of spread, to create a vacuum conditions for disinformation. If there is no air, if there is no oil on, for this fire to continue, uh, then the disinformation will not be able to spread and jump from one platform to another, from one interest group to another. So we have to turn off uh, the air uh, to the light of disinformation by working on strengthening all three pillars. So effective government communications, if there was only effective government communication, everyone was working very uh, uh, greatly with their target audiences, there would not be a miscommunication, no confusions. Uh, if we would be supporting more uh, independent quality journalism, uh, then we would not have to deal with the influence of uh, as I po pointed, uh, weapons of mass destruction, I wouldn't call them uh, necessarily media, it's the, the ones that are uh, Kremlin state-sponsored and backed. And the third is uh, media and information literacy societal resilience level, which is really key. And we have built a lot for this. We have created, for example, a digital manual uh, available not only for civil servants in Latvia, but also to every citizen of the country has a manual on how to recognize disinformation techniques, methods, uh, about which uh, Mr. Gulner uh, spoke earlier on how to effectively counter them and what are also the content-wide, the most often used uh, uh, disinformation narratives against Latvia and how to recognize and how to counter with them with facts. Okay, thank you, Richard. There is a manual. Uh, you can get one, but I guess it's in Latvian, so it would need to be translated, but uh, we can address that. So, again, tools. Uh, Lutz, over to you. And I know you love toolboxes and tools. So what's in your toolbox? Oh, I love toolboxes, and I will spare you kind of uh, all the details. But in principle, um, and we did a lot of work and thinking, and I'm very happy also that this seems to be very much in line with the thinking of... Uh, of the uh, civil society community, in particular, what Anna has said, um, also what Alan has said, we see four areas that really need to be done. The first one is what we call situational awareness. Uh, really, we need to have also tools to understand what is going on. We need to make it public. We need to expose. We need to get access to data in this field. It is crucial uh, to have all this and to be able to analyze it because seeing very often is a good uh, antidote already uh, if you just know what's going on and how these techniques are being done the second point is maybe the obvious one uh, that is very often mentioned uh, it is difficult to do it has many different elements it is uh, what do we call building societal resilience it can be fact-checking initiatives can be support to a more diverse competitive and and highly professional media system it can be uh, support for uh, media literacy initiatives etc the list is very very long 
Um, and of course, it always depends a bit on the mix of the spe uh, specific situations. But there, um, I'm also very eager uh, to underline that we work with a lot of uh, UN countries, uh, a lot of UN members, you know, to help either the governments or civil society sector to develop these skills. That would be the second box. The third box is something that ESG um, Fleming has also mentioned. We need to think about regulation, um, but regulation not of the content, but regulation of behavior, for example, of internet uh, uh, companies or of social media platforms. The European Union has put in place a law on this one. It's called the Digital Services Act, and it does not regulate the content. It does not say what can be said on these platforms or not, but we turned it around. We looked at the risk actually, uh, that emanates uh, from the very dominant kind of position that these platforms have and that their discussions bear or discussions that are happening on their platforms bear for society. And we put a risk management uh, and risk mitigation approach in there. So clear rules also for the platforms um, in this in this area. But I really have to uh, to to underline and that brings me to the fourth box. Regulating the platforms will not solve the issue, and it will be only one of the elements. And that's why we also need to look into uh, broader issues in our UN family, for example. Um, we are clearly thinking also about uh, rules for state actors in this field. We should think about this. What is responsible state behavior in this field? Is a deliberate uh, strategy to manipulate another country with uh, uh, by using disinformation, information manipulation, or technical means, is this a justified, legitimate kind of way of conducting international relations? Um, and you see in the way I put this rhetorical question out. Last point for us, very, very important, is that we do not regulate uh, what can be said and who says what, etc. That would be the wrong way. We want to protect the freedom of speech from malign interference, from manipulation, um, from outside uh, kind of manipulation. And I think with this approach will actually safeguard the freedom of speech and not kind of restrict it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lutz. Uh, we will eat a little bit into the uh, break time between the sessions. So uh, we can go to Anna uh, for a very uh, brief uh, response to the tools and then we'll try to take at least one question from the audience and there is one online. Anna, please. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible, but you can imagine I, I, I do have a lot to say on this question, but we believe that it is holistic and positive measures that are firmly grounded in the right to freedom of expression and, and other human rights, of course, that are the best solution. So I want to give six suggestions for states, and this is not an exhaustive list, but in the interest of time, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible, but six clear ideas. One, ensure a diverse, free, and independent media environment in particular through clear regulatory frameworks that ensure self-governance and independence for the media and broadcasting, broadcasting sector. We also need strong protections online and offline for journalists and media workers. We all know the media can facilitate the free flow of information and expose corruption and falsehoods, etc. Second, implement comprehensive right to information laws including by complying with the principle of maximum disclosure of information and by proactively releasing information of public interest. And of course, governments should not be spreading disinformation themselves. Third, ensure connectivity to an accessible, free, open, reliable, and secure internet, the topic of this forum. The digital divide remains a huge barrier to accessing information and allows this information to remain unchecked, especially for poor rural and remote communities. Four, invest in digital media and information literacy, as mentioned by others. Five, adopt positive policy measures to combat online hate speech. In line with Human Rights Council Resolution 1618, the Rabat Plan of Action and all relevant human rights standards. And finally, work with companies to make sure they too respect human rights. Now, in terms of companies, obviously digital companies in particular, dominant social media platforms have to be a key part of the solution. 
And Article 19 believes that addressing disinformation on social media platforms must be considered, as Melissa Fleming said, in the larger context of their business models, and also in terms of the deficiencies in content moderation practices, which at time lack respect for human rights and the principles of accountability and transparency. But, and we are seeing this increasingly happening already, social media platforms can utilize a variety of flexible responses that do comply with the guiding principles on business and human rights. So rather than banning users or deleting inaccurate content, they can modify algorithms to promote trustworthy content. They can affix labels or warnings. They can provide links to authoritative information, among other positive measures. They need to articulate clear and easily understood policies governing disinformation on their platforms in line with human rights and available in a range of languages. They also need to ensure minimum due process guarantees and full transparency in their engagements with governments. And then in terms of states, well, states need to promote oversight of social media platforms by independent multi-stakeholder institutions, okay. which in our view offers the best solution to be adaptable to the ever-changing context of online communication, okay. rather than trying to regulate the content that should be restricted. Okay, thank you. Anna, thank you. We, I think we have okay. to stop here to be able to take, take one question. Uh, thank you. I can see one over there, please, sir. Uh, there will be a mic coming to you, I hope. And please tell us who you are. Yep. Hey, uh, my name is Raul Plummer. Uh, I'm from Finland. I'm here with uh, Electronic Frontier Finland. Uh, and I wanted to ask, uh, would it be possible uh, for the UN uh, or these other organizations that are concerned about misinformation to uh, help uh, creating a course maybe for uh, like internationally for schools uh, to educate the children um, on media critique? Good question. Uh, who would take it? Uh, so, how do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's a good idea. Please. Uh, uh, yeah. We'll take three questions and then uh, we'll ask uh, speakers to uh, respond. Hello. This is Alishka Pirkova from Access Now. Um, thank you for excellent presentations. Um, I would be more interested if we put the issue of content moderation of disinformation and misinformation online and look maybe a bit deeper into uh, content recommender systems and how the content is being curated, um, where we see that that's one of the main reasons how the disinformation is actually being amplified. But my question is uh, connected to another tool that is currently being involved by a number of legislators, including the EU, and that is that so-called media exemption. Uh, as we know, a uh, number of media are often also bad actors uh, who intentionally spread please, disinformation. Please uh, phrase your question as a question. My question is precisely about the efficiency of media exemption, which in other words is actually mass carry obligation for media content, so the online platforms do not moderate the media content at all and deserve certain privileged treatment. Okay, I would like you. to hear okay. the efficiency of that measure. Thank okay, you very if much. If there is anyone who wants to reflect on the media exemption, I think it's a very specific issue that will be welcome. Please, your question, sir. Thank you so much. I'll be quick. Uh, we had our own story with disinformation attacks here in Russia, starting from February 24th. Before we have faced an enormous amount of fakes and disinformation created and funded by Ukrainian and sometimes European actors. So far, these ads were delivered mostly through Facebook uh, and sir, Instagram. Sir, uh, excuse actors. me. Uh, this uh, first of all. Uh, Oh, this is a session for questions. So uh, Yeah, I had a question. Uh, okay, please yeah. phrase, phrase the question. So it right turns away. out Meta, the global platform, instead of keeping neutrality, had chosen its side in conflict and was helping delivering this kind of fakes and disinformation. So and it was predictably banned in Russia. So my question is do you think platforms must be neutral in conflicts or they have a right to choose a side? Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, so, uh, shall we again start with uh, you, Alan? Uh, uh, would you like to reflect on uh, any of those questions? But uh, pre please uh, do it within one minute, Max. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll actually start with the first question and maybe respond to also the last question. Uh, so, the, about the courseware that is available out there, actually, there is a lot of content. I think we just need to have 
a unified uh, a unified unifying organization like the UN and I agree with you to actually you know collect all this information that is available out there on how to counter uh, mis and disinformation in itself so that we can create a curricula that can be seeded across different countries so I do agree uh, on that with you and I'll, I'd like also to hear from my counterpart and on the last question I, I think yeah, I, I think Basically, that is why the platforms need to counter disinformation. They should not have a preference on any type of disinformation, right? So I do agree with you that platforms need to be uh, strategic enough to look at disinformation as, uh, as, as a content. That it's not specific to specific actors. It's actually just fighting disinformation in itself. But also state actors need to be held accountable whenever that happens. So, Rickert, media teaching, media, uh, media literacy, teaching about disinformation, media exemption, if you have a comment on that, and uh, should the platforms be neutral? Very quick answers on this, please. Uh, on a media uh, exemption, I will leave it to the EU uh, uh, panelist uh, from the ES. Uh, on the media information literacy, I think the implementation is key. We have so many uh, national and inter international already initiatives. We don't have to create always uh, in, invent the bicycle uh, uh, from scratch. It's already there. It's uh, actually on how to ride the bicycle uh, and, and, and just to just ride it, <laughs> actually. And the implementation is the key. And on the platforms, uh, well, well, it's well, it's a challenging question. I mean, it's we we, we could devote a whole session to this, but uh, platforms are not media themselves, so they don't necessarily have to uh, follow the traditional media rules. Important uh, comment. Uh, we go very quickly uh, up to our uh, rem uh, remote uh, speakers, uh, Lutz. Uh, so, teaching about disinformation and media literacy. Uh, if you have again something to say about the media exemption and uh, should platforms be uh, neutral? Good. Uh, very, very briefly. Uh, media literacy is key, uh, but we should not centralize it kind of at the level of the United Nations, uh, that there's only one size fits all. It needs to be, of course, tailored to specific audiences, etc. So I think uh, uh, that is something we need to push. Uh, there should also be uh, support. Uh, there should be kind of uh, material, etc. But please not the one kind of and only kind of approach to it, because that would be quite, quite challenging, I think. Second Second point about media exemption, uh, it would even take some time to explain what it is, but we do not have the media exemption in our Digital Services Act, even if there were uh, wide discussions. There are some arguments in favor, some uh, against, and uh, those that are against, and I'm also in this camp, um, recognize that a lot of media are actually not really media. They have been used as uh, as instruments, for example, uh, also of other states. Uh, look at RT, for example, which has been used as an instrument also to support uh, exactly what is happening in the Russian war against Ukraine, for example. Platforms should uh, um, be neutral or not. Platforms, first of all, need to comply with law. Um, but of course, uh, that can become very, very complicated for the platforms at uh, the moment when they have, uh, when they become subject to very, um, let's say, uh, problematic laws in some of the countries they are, they are um, operating in. So for me, kind of key principles is really the core element. And that is freedom of speech, um, upholding, um, but of course, also, as everybody said, freedom of speech is not a free pass for everything. And that is, uh, and there we would be very, very close to what also uh, the colleague of Article 19 has said beforehand. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, Lutz. Uh, and really, uh, uh, the next session is starting now. So you have 30 seconds to uh, respond to what you believe is the most important uh, uh, in this discussion. Okay, as quickly as I can. One, of course, as I said, uh, we talked about the literacy aspect. Various initiatives exist, more can be done. Second, I'm going to park that, can't do that in 30 seconds. The third, I would just like to refer to the recent report from the Special Rapporteur, Irene Khan, which has a lot of very good uh, recommendations in terms of how to deal with this information uh, in the context of war, and I would like to refer to these excellent recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, now we are really uh, uh, short on time. We have to, f uh, to stop here. I would like to thank very much our speakers for excellent ideas, and uh, thank you indeed, uh, the audience, for being here, and uh, I hope we can return to the topic again. Thank Thank you very much.